Hi, everybody. Hello. How's everyone doing tonight? Um, thank you all for joining us tonight. Welcome. Um, we would like to acknowledge um, Mayor Glover and Councilman Hugel, as well as uh, Planning Commissioner Hines. I hope that I didn't miss anybody. Hi. Um, I'm Julie Chop, Principal Planner with the City of Portsmouth. Um, this informational meeting is being recorded and will be available on the City's Planning Department website as well as the City's YouTube channel. This PowerPoint will also be available on the Planning Department website. This presentation will provide explanations on pertinent pr proposed code amendments to the City's zoning ordinance. Please note that not all of the proposed code amendments will be explained in this presentation. Staff has selected the most relevant amendments to explain today. Many of the proposed code amendments are routine housekeeping items that do not significantly impact the development community. In the interest of time, please hold all questions until the end of the presentation. And a Q&A session will be held immediately following the presentation presentation where staff will address all of questions. Okay. At the November 1st, 2022 Planning Commission public hearing, the Planning Commission adopted a resolution that initiating staff to prepare proposed amendments to the city zoning ordinance for consideration by Planning Commission as well as City Council. At the January 17th, 2023 Planning Commission public hearing, citizens and commissioners requested that staff hold an informational meeting to explain the per pertinent proposed code amendments. As with any zoning ordinance, it is anticipated that minor amendments will be necessary to adjust for changes to the Code of Virginia, improve clarity and ease of use, streamline development regulations, and address matters that arise as, as it is implemented and as the community character progresses. The majority of the proposed text amendments are routine minor adjustments that are proposed to make sections of the zoning ordinance more clear and easier to use. It is a standard practice to amend the city zoning ordinance text as part of ongoing maintenance. Several modifications to the standards for the downtown D1 subdistricts are proposed. The required open space set aside or the portion of a proposed multifamily, three to four family, and mixed use development required for reservation as permanent open space is proposed to be reduced to align with the requirements for the rest of the city. The open space set aside standard for Districts T5 and T6 are proposed to be eliminated to allow for more intense development. Density is the number of residential dwelling units permitted per acre of land. In light of several situations where the maximum permitted density did not allow the desired number of units, as well as to further the goals, the city's goal of providing additional housing, the maximum permitted density for the downtown subdistricts is proposed to be increased. The minimum required density in the D1 districts is proposed to remain at the current figure in order to prevent penalizing those who do not want to develop at a higher density. Okay. Another change proposed for the D1 districts is to add standards for accessory structures in the D1. An accessory structure is a structure that is detached from and subordinate to the principal structure in use and square footage, such as a shed or a garage. Previously, standards did not exist for accessory structures in the D1, so this is a needed change. These standards are in line with accessory structure standards with, within other districts and still maintain the character of the downtown area. This proposed change allows applicants who are converting an existing structure in the D1 the flexibility of not having to comply with the minimum or maximum density requirement. This change encourages redevelopment and the reuse of existing buildings. 
It is often necessary to add uses to the zoning ordinance. Staff foresees a need for a use to provide for a case where a mixed use development is able to convert a ground floor unit from commercial to residential. For example, this provision would make it easier to fill a vacant storefront. This change provides additional flexibility to business owners, particularly in the downtown. This proposed change relates to, the proposed changes related to a family day home use bring the city zoning ordinance in line with state code requirements, as well as clarify the process. A family day home is the licensed care of five to 12 children in a residential home. When someone applies for a family day home use, the zoning administrator mails a notice to the neighboring property owners. If an adjoining property owner replies with a written objection to the proposed use, the zoning administrator will deny the zoning permit. This change to the zoning ordinance allows the applicant who was denied to then apply for a use permit to request that city council review and approve the family day home use. Many uses are subject to standards specific to that use. These are known as use specific standards to ensure the use is harmonious with the sur surrounding area. Staff is seeing an increase in two family dwellings or duplexes and is proposing use specific standards to ensure the development of two family uses is appropriate. The city is particularly concerned with the safety of its residents. This proposed change requires that all multifamily dwellings within the city install security cameras encompassing the front, sides, and rear exteriors of the establishment for 24 hours per day. We are also seeing an increase in requests for shipping containers slash chassis storage yards within the city. This use is more appropriate on larger lots so as to avoid their development on smaller lots, a two acre minimum lot size is proposed. Staff frequently gets complaints from citizens about neighbors storing heavy trucks, trailers, or major recreational equipment for longer than is permitted. So this change proposes to provide some clarification. The change includes defining major recreational equipment as any equipment used for transporting people or property in connection with recreation and or designed for temporary occupancy, including but not limited to boats, jet skis, trailers, campers, motorhomes, racing vehicles, off-road vehicles, or trailers, as well as clarifying where and how long these types of vehicles and equipment may be stored in residential areas. Okay. The Maximum density for the neighborhood mixed use as well as the general mixed use zoning districts are proposed to be increased to provide additional flexibility and options for developers as well as to increase housing options within the city. The newly established innovation overlay district includes the uptown area of the city. A corresponding increase to the maximum dwelling units per acre is also proposed for this area that is poised for revitalization. The only proposed setback change is to provide for additional flexibility for lots that are zoned general mixed use or GMU. This is a change that existed in the previous chapter 40.1 zoning ordinance but was inadvertently left out of the update. The change would provide for a 10 foot side yard setback if the parcel is less than 100 feet in width. The minimum N unit lot width for NMU is proposed to be reduced from 35 to 25, which will provide for additional options for townhouse units within the NMU district. Minor modifications to the off-street parking requirements are also proposed. This slide shows the proposed change to the required bicycle standards for multifamily dwellings. In practice, staff found that the long-term bike spaces requirement was too burdensome for multifamily developers. This proposed change provides some relief 
while maintaining adequate bicycle spaces for multifamily residents and visitors. Additionally, it is proposed that to require that 50% of the bike parking be located close to the closest vehicle parking space or within 50 feet of a building entrance rather than 100% of the required bike spaces. The zoning ordinance currently allows applicants to submit an alternative parking plan for review by the zoning administrator that proposes an alternative number of off-street parking spaces by, uh, that is required by the zoning ordinance. This proposed change allows an applicant to submit an alternative parking plan to request an alternative number of bicycle spaces than what is required. This change is in light of feedback from recent multifamily applicants and an attempt to provide additional flexibility to developers. Landscape buffers are areas of vegetation required by the zoning ordinance to separate uses in different use classifications. A change is proposed to modify where certain types of buffers are required to be based on the existing conforming use that is adjacent to the proposed development rather than determining the buffer type that is required by what the neighboring zoning district is. This change will assist with protecting uses from new developments that may be more intense than the existing. The tree canopy requirement for developments in the urban residential district is proposed to be modified from 20% to 15% to align with updated legislation from the General Assembly. A change is proposed that provides a maximum illumination level at the property line for industrial uses that abut residential, commercial, or mixed use. Previously, there was no maximum illumination level for industrial uses. This change ensures surrounding units are, uses are protected from any negative effects. This proposed change would allow ground signs within the neighborhood residential NR and general residential GR zoning districts. A ground sign is a permanent freestanding sign that is taller than it is wide and there is no air underneath it. This change is proposed in order to increase the signage options within the city. A statement is proposed to be added to the special exception use permit and or the Certificate of Appropriateness administrative sections to clarify that if the General Assembly grants an extension of these land use approvals, that they are in fact extended in line with the General Assembly approval. The last amendment is a minor, are minor housekeeping changes that are proposed to increase the accuracy and the functionality of the zoning ordinance. The CA-22-01 proposed code amendments will be heard at the March 7th Planning Commission public hearing at 1.30 p.m. in this room, the City Council Chamber. There will be a work session at 12.30 p.m. That, is, that the public is welcome to attend but are not able to participate. Following a recommendation by Planning Commission, CA-22-01 is scheduled to be heard by City Council at their 11, April 11th public hearing at 7 p.m. For the remainder of this informational meeting, staff is happy to answer any questions regarding the proposed amendments to the text of the city's ordinance. Feel free to come up to the mic to ask any questions that you may have. Bill Watts, Mimosa Road, Portsmouth. Uh, on the security canvas for multifamily dwellings, uh, I recommend that we include all the property, especially the parking lot, because if there's any uh, bad actors out there, a lot of that's gonna go down in the parking lot, and it would be beneficial to the people living there, and I would think if I was looking to rent, it would make it the property more desirable to me because I would feel more safer 
because if, uh, like I say, we got some bagged actors doing whatever they're doing in the park lot and other areas, common areas or whatever, then the police can come and pull the tapes and, make, and take care of this crime situation. So I'm recommending we go from just the building to all the property. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I um, will definitely um, look into that and hopefully do some more research and um, identify if, if we need to make a change on that. But I think it's a great suggestion. Okay. Um, John Lifsey, I live at 229 Mount Vernon in Port Norfolk. Got several questions. One is on page two, the um, ground floor conversion. Okay. Does that mean that storefronts in our neighborhood of Port Norfolk can be converted to apartments now without any requirement from the city? No. So, um, in because we have three right now that we hear rumors that they're going to convert them to apartments that are now businesses. Well, right now they they would have to. Um, the proposal is for them to have to get a special exception in order to do that. So they would have to request, submit an application before okay. the board so of So they just appeals. can't arbitrarily go in and do it without anybody having to say so? Correct. But that would be approved, I'm assuming, if they went. I mean, it would be up to the discretion of the Board of Zoning Appeals. But uh, even but though it's in a historic district, that would override it? It would override Right now, historic district, you can't do that. So would that override the historic district requirements? Well, so the it so the one the, it, this is just a proposed change, but if it did get approved, they that still wouldn't give them permission to change the exterior of the of the structure. They would still have to go through the COA process okay. and and get a certificate of appropriateness um, from the the HPC. So it still could happen. Is what I'm asking. Okay. It could, yes. Yeah. But if it's approved. Okay, on page three, uh, two family dwellings. Right now, in our neighborhood, you can't subdivide a single family into more than one family. Will that change that in Port Norfolk or in the historic districts? So this, um, no. So this is not okay. changing the required lot size. It's just adding standards if someone is developing a two family okay. use. The other one, Rick, is not a Port Norfolk thing. It's a citywide thing. Um, on page five, um, heavy trucks. So this is now saying that you can park a heavy truck in your yard for three days. Is that what this says? That's what I'm reading. It's the, okay, so this one is saying, um, wait, I'm on the wrong page. So this, the first part of this um, amendment is defining what co constitutes a major recreational equipment, and then it's also modifying the language. So if you the the pre, the current language, so what is currently in place is um, what's crossed out, and then the new the newly proposed language is um, underlined. Right. So previously it said it's going from four days and we're proposing it be moved to three consecutive days, not to exceed 20 days within any calendar year. We've always been told by the city that trucks could park for 12 hours during the day and not at night at all. Now this is saying they can stay for three days. So basically we're going to turn our neighborhood into a big rig parking lot is what's going to well, happen. No, so this is saying, and in, in I mean, it's only for three days in any front yard or corner side yard. So this does not pertain to the right of way at all. I understand that. Okay. It does. Yeah, on the street, no. But you're okay. saying now, if they park it in their yard, they can park it for three days. I mean, we have 40 foot wide lots with driveways, mm -hmm. so they can back a big rig in there and park it for three days. Everybody. Well, right now, before this is even proposed, they could do it for four days. No. Like, yeah. No. Not, I, I promised you. They can do it for 12 hours during the day. Well, so what, so what I'm trying to say is that the, it, the language that is written right here that is crossed out is, the cur is what's currently happening. Like, okay. that's the current code. So we're proposing to change that by crossing out 
the words that are crossed out and underline the ones that are underlined would be the new language. Okay. So it's. I don't understand why we want to be a second class city and allow trucks park everywhere, but okay. <laughs> Pardon? I understand, but uh, you know, we've always fought that just because of the look of it. I mean, if everybody drives a big rig and parks in your neighborhood, it's going to look like a big rig parking lot. Yeah, I think that we, we're, we're actually making it, the, the standard, more stringent. Like it's. Okay. So it All might right. not be stringent enough, but, but we can definitely look into that further. Hey, good Hi. to see you again. Um, I had a question about the residential density. Um, the, uh, we're actually doing something on High Street, um, mixed use development, and uh, this density increase benefits us. But uh, my question to you is that if we're already in the process of almost being approved and we were going through the resiliency process to increase our potential density, this looks like we won't have to go through that process and it'll kind of be already implemented into legislation. How does that work for someone that's already in the process to be able to get these benefits for the density increase? So once, um, so if the um, proposed code amendment is approved by city council, so if it's heard, right now it's scheduled to be heard on that April 11th meeting, okay. then that, from that date, then it would be considered the new standard, like it would be in place. So does that mean we have to go back through the permit process? which is kind of... I might have... Yeah? Okay. Go, go ahead, Meg, if you want to. Okay. What was that? Yeah. Okay, so we'll have to just resubmit our paperwork through that process because that's yes. like a three or four month okay. process. Okay. I think I'm being told that, yes, you would okay. have to. All right. Okay. Thank okay. Good evening, uh, Julie. Thank you for the presentation. Um, one of the things that we talk about, and we've obviously had this discussion before, where you're putting uh, commercial storefront units and turning them into apartments. This was an argument back when they were proposing to take the 700 block, which is now Bloom Coworking, and turning it all into apartments and frosting out every window in that whole block. Um, that doesn't help the businesses that are across the street, nor does it help the continuation or the continuity of the business district on High Street specifically uh, to continue westward on, on uh, across Effingham. So we changed that. We, we, we pretty well fought that, but it was, it was going in that direction. But what I would caution staff and consider that when you are looking at dwellings on the first floor, take into consider uh, vehicles on, on the roadway as, as a way to say, okay, High Street, no, because you've got 5,000, 6,000 vehicles at least in that block. Uh, but, uh, you know, Green Street, 1,500 cars, big difference. You see what I'm saying? So whereas to you not breaking up the continuity of your business district because your business district is there to provide a service and mixed-use uh, businesses are, 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 are needed. Um, the other thing I would like to also ask is what was the response when in the last administration said that the form-based code was basically not working and we had to blow it up and we did and this is obviously fixing a lot of those uh, things that we decided to blow up um, from form based code before how much how much input did you get I know I was one of them and was was totally against the idea of con taking uh, workshop frontage and turning it into light industrial mainly because of the fact that it bastardized about 28 residential homes to non-conforming lot sizes where you have to buy five houses to make it a workable lot uh, because of the setbacks um, and personally having one of the largest pieces of property in that district they still can't do anything with it um, because of those setbacks so is that going to be addressed in these changes to where those 28 houses are not going to continue to just dilap be, be, to stay dilapidated and, and not be able to have a chance to recoup um, or have be built, rebuilt oh. so the standards or the proposed code amendments within this set of code amendments, I don't think it specifically addresses that, but they do have those properties do have the ability to, you know, to 
operate any use that is permitted within the zoning district, even if the actual lot is non-conforming. Mm -hmm. Like the, so if the lot does not meet the lot size, they can still, you know, have a warehouse there. It just has to meet all the other zoning standards. Yeah, but those 28 houses we know were 28 foot by 75 foot lots. So mm -hmm. that's a little bit of a small warehouse with, with setbacks in, included. Mm -hmm. um, so that was that was one of the main issues of, of converting that area up there to IL instead of uh, yeah. instead of form based code and, and workshop frontage where they could be reused because yeah. the setbacks the setbacks were minimal if anything they were they were zero lot lines in some cases mm -hmm. um, at least it gave them they gave them a chance and they could still use it as residential uses inside that area now those residential units are are pretty much on their own to survive so. Well, we, so we are also, um, for that newly established um, innovation overlay district, there is a um, plan in, that is being worked on to, um, to create a master plan for that area. And as part of that, there could be a zoning overlay. Um, and so we're working with a consultant right now. And so, and I, yeah, I, I think that, yeah, it would be great to have, you know, you have them in touch with you guys regarding that outreach and see if that's something that you know would would help those um those 28 lots and you know see if there's some kind of you know compromise and a solution that we can find to that okay all right thank you really my purview but it's just something i noticed in port norfolk especially and especially along our waterways um, with the new minimum requirement of two acres for the container storage yards, is that all, land all, all must already be zoned industrial? So a, um, a shipping container slash chassis storage yard is only permitted with a use permit in the, in, um, property, on properties that are zoned industrial or light industrial. Okay. And, and then are there any sort of... Um, because the ones that are zoned light industrial abut some residential properties, mm -hmm. is there anything going to be put in the code regulations about the height? I see you've got like the 50 foot, mm -hmm. you so, know, but, but for the height, not only for safety for the people who live right next door or have their backyards next to it. Um, I know we have storms in Virginia occasionally, so not just because of that, but just because also um, blocking the view for yeah. some people Correct. from their backyard. So is, is there any consideration being given to a maximum number of containers that can be stacked, for example? Yes, there actually currently in the code, there's um, a separate list of use specific standards for shipping containers slash chassis storage yards. And the, what is that five, four? So it's four, whoa, really off, sorry. It's okay. So the current standard is that they can only be stacked four containers high. Okay, so would that um, be adjusted for these smaller lots? So for example, you know how we have A, B, C, D for multi-residential units and different standards for those. Would that be a consideration for smaller lot sizes to have a different height requirement or you know if it abuts a residential what well, should it should it be shorter in other words yeah so because that use the shipping container slash ch chassis storage yard anywhere that it's developed it does require a use permit there can be additional conditions that are added on to that as contingent upon the approval okay yeah and um, I guess the, the second question is, um, when you're talking about planning ground cover um, for the um, new developments and having them within 10 feet of another development, reducing it from 20 to 10 feet, are we looking at, do we have something in the code that specifies what ground cover is? And can we, especially the wetlands board, take a look especially on the drainage easements, and maybe make some recommendations on different types of plantings that might be more effective in preventing erosion than just simple grass seed, in other words. Oh, okay, I think I see what you're referring to. Yes. So the okay. zoning ordinance does define ground cover, I believe. 
yes, that does define ground cover. Um, and I guess, Meg, do you want to take this question? I'm not exactly sure what. Which code amendment is she talking about? I'm not. So I think. It I don't was think we're one. doing anything about ground cover. I think we're. Do, are you talking about. Um, Oh, okay. So that's yep. for setbacks. That's not about planting Just ground covers. Just for covers. setbacks. That's for the setback. Oh, mm -hmm. and, and what Julie showed in the chart there is that for the other zoning districts, if the lot is less than 100 feet in width, you can already do that 10 foot setback. That's all that's being changed. It's not okay, about Okay, so it's plants. just the setback. It's just the building setback. The setbacks okay. are about buildings. Okay, just yeah. the building. So just the building all the regular setback. codes, Amy, would apply, correct? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yep. All right. Yeah, it's just the building setback. I see. Yeah. That's okay. <laughs> and so I, I see ground cover. I didn't hear this. <laughs> and just to your question about the shipping container storage yards and the and the minimum lot size, you, you're talking about being smaller. But right now there is no minimum, so they could do it on a half an acre lot. Right. And so this is a an idea to get only larger lots to right. to be able to have that use. But fix it once, right? Yeah. <laughs> fix it once. You know, sometimes you got to be eat the elephant one bite at a time. <laughs> Hi, John again. I got a question, follow up what she just asked. Storage yeah. container lots, the Port of Virginia, are they exempt from these rules? Yeah. The 300, 200 and 300 block of Chautauqua, they abut the Port of Virginia storage containers and they're stacked five high right up against the fence. Yeah, I think that the port is exempt from, from zoning standards. So. Oh, okay, yes. Correct. I see what you're saying. Yep. The zoning authority does does not carry on federal property or state property. Correct. Any other questions, guys? I feel like I'm ready. Ready. Okay. Oh. Uh-oh. Good evening. I'm Mark Gadolda-Gitrovsky. I, I live in the Sterling Point neighborhood of Portsmouth. And I am very grateful to all of you, uh, to the planning staff, to the planning commission, and to uh, especially to Council Member Hugel for helping make this happen tonight. I still have an issue, though, with putting together an omnibus, I'm calling it an omnibus, sort of packet that will come before city council, come before the planning commission again, and come before city council, because what with the opportunity to discuss these things here at, at this point in time, it is still possible for others in the community to key in on the required notice that you must publish about what is going on and say, oh my goodness, I've got a problem with this, 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 and the other thing. And they weren't represented here tonight. And because of the structure that uh, public hearings have, there is a five minute time limit for each speaker with which to address one or 1,000 items that are encompassed by the public hearing topic. So, of course, we all have the ability to go home, pull this up, burn the midnight oil between now and the 7th of March, and find all those points that give us heartburn and document them in writing. Yes. And then what will happen? 
So our email, which if printed out, would look like some sort of congressional budget amendment, would go to the members of the Planning Commission and then on to the members of City Council. And these folks on the Planning Commission are volunteers. And the people on City Council are paid volunteers. And they are just not going to step through a mass of comments that come in in, in the time frames that, that we have for acting on these. So to me, it would be desirable to break these things into smaller packets that are manageable. There's no way I could talk about 10 items if I had, if I had issues with 10 items um, in a five minute time frame and do justice to them and make a well-reasoned argument for why these things don't work. Mm -hmm. It'd be sort of rapid fire, like the way you step through, I don't know, what, was it 20 pages of, of slides? You actually didn't read them. You didn't actually talk about the rationale behind those particular decisions. You did your best. You did your best to try to make it fit the time allotted and the attention span of those of us in the audience. Because if you had gone through them thoroughly, it would have been more than two hours. And mm -hmm. you probably would have had a large number of people here who were fighting off sleep or losing the battle. So what do we do? I, I really think these things have to be broken down into smaller units if we're going to do justice to them in terms of being able to consider them deliberately. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jocelyn Dumois, Interim Director of Planning. I think that was an excellent idea. Uh, when I first came here, uh, I'm the one that cut the thing off. All right. So when I first came here, I'd been here a week. And I was given the code amendments, and I thought, wow, there's a lot of code amendments here. And, and, and I said, all right, I said, there's a lot of code amendments here. And I think I sent a letter to the uh, attorney saying, can we sort of stop this? Let's, let's, let's slow this down a little bit. But I understood staff, and, and they have a new zoning ordinance that they've had for two, two years. They're still working on it. And what you do is, as you go through the zoning ordinance, it's like 300 pages or more, and you find things that should be changed. So you put a, you make a note, change that. You keep going through another section, you make a note, you do that. So what happened is they had quite a few items on their list, and it, it was decided to go the whole group and some of them are connected and some are not connected so i do like the idea of maybe breaking it up and coming back to you with just maybe half of it and do it in sections and so i think it's a great idea we weren't trying to do anything nefarious we're not going to zone rezone your house for a pig farm anything like that it's just that these are <laughs> were some housekeeping items and we were doing that and and I, we heard what you said and julie did an excellent presentation Excellent, you did an excellent presentation. And we heard what you said, we're listening, and my suggestion going back to staff will be to let's break that package up to make it more understandable. And I really thank you all for coming out tonight. All right, thank you guys for coming. Um, please feel free to email me or call me with any questions. Um, I appreciate you guys coming, thank you.